Hi, everyone. I hope you're all keeping well today. Uh, welcome to this webinar, Business Recoded, Shaping the Organization of the Future. Uh, so my name is Loïc Lemarois. I'm a senior marketing manager at Headspring, and today I'll be your host. Uh, so this webinar is intended to be interactive. The main goal is that we want to hear from you. So please do send in your comments, your questions by using the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screen. It should be in the application. Uh, we'll make sure to answer them during the session or we'll actually answer them during the Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so without further delay, I would like to introduce you to Peter Fisk. Uh, he's a global thought leader. Uh, he's a professor of leadership, strategy and innovation at IE Business School. He's as well a best-selling author and an inspiring speaker. Um, so he leads Genius Work, which is a future business accelerator working with executive teams to explore their futures. Uh, so today, we'll today Peter will explore his latest book, Business Recoded, Have the Courage to Create a Better Future. Hi, Peter. Glad you could join us for a Headspring webinar. Hey, Louis. Great to see you. It's great to be here and uh, thank you to everyone um, who's uh, joined in this morning. So I'm going to be talking about Business Recoded and really giving you a bit of inspiration um, to what the future might look like and also courage, as the book says, um, to create a better future and a better organization even than we have today. Okay, so let's get started. Um, what I'd love for you to do is to kind of use that um, function on the side of your screen to just tell me where you're coming from this morning. So, you know, I can't see you, I can't hear you, but you can see me. So let's let's hear where, where people are coming from this morning. So just type in where you're coming from, uh, the country or the city uh, where you're coming from around the world. And uh, let's see who we've got this morning. So whilst you're doing that, um, I'm going to be talking about um, the book, which is really kind of something I sat down and started writing um, during the midst of the pandemic when it struck last uh, March. And for six months, I went around the world online and talked to some of the most amazing companies who were doing things um, in terms of every different sector. So really looking at what is happening in the world of business, how are organizations changing, how are they embracing new technologies, how are they embracing the power shifts towards Asia, for example, the new millennials joining the workforce? And what are they doing about COVID, obviously, in terms of the way in which the world is changing and how they're responding? So I'm getting some responses now. So welcome Julie from Edinburgh and Andrea from Portugal. And we've got some more coming in a moment. But the big question which I really want people to think about right now it's not just how we're going to survive, how we're going to get through this pandemic, because we will, but it's how do you see the future? This is the moment when actually the most innovative companies seize the opportunities of a changing world, the fractured society of a pandemic, the disruption which is caused and say, well, how can I do better? How can I do better for people, for society, but also how can I do better as a business for a better world? So how do you see the future is a really big question, which I would ask any executive right now. And one of the things which came out from writing the book is probably, you know, most people spend too much time looking backwards. We're always looking at results of the business of last year. We're looking at the capabilities which got us here, not which is what we're gonna get us further ahead. We're looking backwards in terms of what we've done. We're not looking forwards in terms of what we will do. So one of the big things I'd love to talk about is your future potential, both your individual, personal future potential, but also in terms of your organization. What is the potential and how can you increase that potential to do more in the future? So let's start off with um, a few things which are happening right now. So if you look at these four images, these come from stories which you may have seen in the press, online, over the last two weeks. So I don't know whether anybody recognizes any of these stories. Perhaps type them into the, uh, into the question and answer bar if you, can, if you recognize any of these stories, what's happening here. So 
if I was just to, to give you some of them uh, whilst you're thinking. Um, the top one on the left is Dubai. I think most of us can recognize that. Um, but that's a, that's a, a GM-made um, cruise origin car. And the Dubai City Council have just bought 4,000 of them. Um, so they're entirely autonomous vehicles. There's no driving seat inside them. They're entirely electric vehicles. And Cruise is actually a, a electric vehicle a division of GM, which Mary Barra created when she stepped up to become the CEO when it was in a desperate situation, Chapter 11. And people thought there was no future of GM. She bought a small um, electric car company. She paid $1 billion for it. That business unit is now worth $30 billion. And you can see there, the city of Dubai is suddenly going to go driverless uh, with the future of mobility very, very soon. Down the bottom, you can see a Lufthansa DC-8. And you might say, well, cargo business has been doing pretty well during the pandemic. Um, passengers have not been traveling. Well, what they found was that the cargo business is really booming and they needed bigger aircraft. And their DC-8 aircraft just weren't big enough. So they decided to sell them off. There's not actually a big market for secondhand airplanes at the moment. And so they had an auction. The average price of their DC-8, which they sold at auction in the last two weeks, was $22,500. So maybe the same price in secondhand cars. So if anybody's got $22,000, you can have an airplane. I don't know what you're going to do with it. Um, then, then we saw Lego, and um, they uh, just published their, their, re their results for last year. And Lego found that actually um, adult crafting was the biggest new area in their business portfolio. So developing lots of new products and Lego kits for adults, not just for children. And that was the fastest growing part of their business. And then just uh, three days ago, we saw Adidas. They um, formed a joint venture with the New Zealand company Allbirds. Allbirds make these fantastic, um, entirely natural, sustainable shoes, the com most comfortable in the world, they say. And Adidas have, have formed a joint venture uh, with them to make what they call the Futurecraft footprint. It will be available to buy in a few weeks' time. And every pair of shoes, they measure the entire carbon footprint from sourcing and manufacturing to distribution and to use and to disposal. And you can see written on the sole there is actually the, the, the amount of carbon. So 2.94 kilograms of carbon dioxide is um, the, uh, the total amount of emission during the lifetime. Compare that to an average running shoe of about 12 to 15 kilograms, so 75% less. So you can see there very quickly just a few snapshots of a changing world, incredibly fast in terms of some of the things which we talked about in terms of the future, but changes in many, many different ways. Changes, markets are changing, the priorities of consumers, the ways in which we work, and the ways in which we make and deliver things. You know, the next 10 years, we will see more change than the last 250 years which sounds like a nice glib statement, but think about what it really matters. You know, think about the last 250 years, the steam engine, how did that transform business to produce masses of things in factories? Henry Ford launching the first car, which was available to everybody at a relatively low price, transformed from a horse economy. The telephone, the telegraph, connecting the world in real time so that we could work across borders and we can work so much faster. The man on the moon changing the dreams of what people thought was possible as innovators, but also the expectations of what people expected companies to do at the same time. And then 30 years of digital tsunami to the point where every one of us has a mobile phone more powerful than the, than the NASA space shuttle inside us right now and all that knowledge at our fingertips. That's the past. That was the last 250 years. But think how that size of change could happen in our businesses and in our societies over the next 10 years. And what are you going to do about it? But of course, you know, that was all exciting and great until the pandemic struck. But as we all know, we've lived through a time of incredible experimentation. 
you know, so online shopping, 10 years worth of change in eight weeks, one of the world's leading retailers say. Disney managed to do what Netflix took seven years to do in five weeks, five months, when it launched its new Disney Plus streaming service. Health consultations are now almost entirely um, online. So using artificial intelligence to screen what's wrong with you. Do you need to talk to a doctor? If you do, then click on onto a FaceTime or to a um, video call and to be able to get a quick diagnosis. So actually accelerating the speed at which you can talk to a doctor and the accessibility of doctors uh, to patients across the world. And then we've seen this huge experiment too in the world of education and work, as you're all familiar with, more of that later. But what we've really seen is an acceleration of change, not just 250 years and 10 years, but perhaps almost in one year, which is in some ways not surprising. Because if you look at every crisis which the world has gone through, um, this is Schumpeter waves created by the Austrian economist. Every crisis creates a downturn, but it's typically followed by an upturn again. We all know how, how economies work in cycles. But there's two things interesting here. Firstly, you see every time that there's a new upturn, there's a new revolution, if you like. There's a new age which starts to emerge be it in terms of steam and rail and steel, or in terms of electricity, or in terms of digital more recently. You can also see how those curves, those, those cycles are getting shorter. So this dynamics of changing markets are getting faster and faster. But two things which come out from a downturn. Firstly, more companies are created during downturns than at any other time. 54% of the Fortune 500 were created during a downturn. Companies like McDonald's, the soupy speedy fryer, were, were allowed them to deliver incredibly low cost fast food in the Great Depression. Apple and Microsoft both launched during the downturn, giving people automation in a new way from their laptops or desktops. Then we had Airbnb and Uber during the financial crisis of 2008, launching to solve different problems in different ways. 92% of patents are filed during a downturn. So now is the time of innovation. Now is the time when the next generation of companies are taking shape. So it's not a time to have your head down, it's a time to have your head up and, and reimagine the future. You know, think about where you're going, not just to survive, not just to get back, because hopefully there's no going back, but also, what are you going to do in this next 10 years into the future? And if we look at the companies who've done best over the last 12 months, you're know, taking some of the data from the Financial Times and other sources, you can see which companies, based on their market value, um, have done best over the 12 month period, January to December 2020. Now, you know, this is one way of measuring an organization. There's many ways of measuring success, obviously. But if we look at the market value, the, the market capitalization, that, that takes into account the future, the confidence and the scale which people see in an organization's future potential. And you can see at the top, the American ones, you can see in the middle, the Asian ones, and you can see at the bottom, the European ones. So you know, Tesla, obviously, is um, not surprisingly taking the headlines. It grew from about 75 to almost um, $700 billion during the 12 months, 10 times. That's absolutely incredible. So a huge, massive growth, and we'll talk about what actually drove that and, and why that's so significant, but now towering above um, the rest of the automotive industry. Zoom did pretty well. Eric Yuan used to work for WebEx. He came to his senses and he found a much more intuitive, simple, uh, reliable way of making conferencing work. And Zoom then multiplied incredibly quickly. It was fastest off the board, particularly working with educators and businesses. CrowdStrike in terms of security. Pinterest is an interesting one. People started shopping on social media. So Pinterest shops and Instagram shops became the new normal in terms of online shopping. So that was really interesting. In Asia, we've got some interesting ones. Let's go to BYD first of all. Anybody know BYD? Well, BYD is actually the largest um, electric vehicle company in the world by volume. 
So more uh, electric vehicles sold from BYD, the Chinese company, than any other. The average price of a car is $7,000 compared to $70,000 for Tesla. So, so incredibly high scale in terms of their growth. Not that profitable yet, but in terms of their growth and therefore their future potential. The two companies which really are interesting from a retailing angle, you know, C and Pinduoduo. So C, um, that's Forrest Lee there, he, he was a gamer and he created a gaming company which grew incredibly fast during um, the pandemic, but he then connected it to a retail, an online retail model. And bringing the two things together, gamification and retailing, was a real sweet spot. Underneath that, he put a payment system, which was really the, the master stroke, and that actually sustains people working between the two and coming back again and again as a new habit. Pinduoduo is really one of the most exciting companies in the world right now. They're Chinese, and they combine gamification and retail, but also social media. So imagine, you know, a bit like if you were walking down a mall, you walk down a virtual mall online with your friends, you're chatting to them, on WeChat, for example, and then you're kind of getting to a point, you see a fantastic online store, you start comparing what you like best, you start recommending to each other, but then you want to buy something, so you play a game. The better you play the game, the better discount you get. And so you as a, a group of people collaboratively are participating in this quite immersive experience to the point where you're getting what you want to buy or you're telling further friends or you're bringing other friends in together. So a real different dynamic by which retail can happen. And then changing the story again, we can see Adyen from the Netherlands, that's another payment service, um, the most successful company in Europe, followed by a huge number of renewable energy companies, so Vestas, EDP and Siemens, really showing that renewable energies took off during the last year. So if we look at some of the markets, you know, last year, 2020, was really this kind of true tipping point when markets were shaking up in a huge, big way. So if I was to ask you, you know, which one of these companies is the most valuable? Um, probably most of you, I don't know if anybody's going to answer online now. Let's get a bit of interaction going if we can. Um, so if you think which one's the most valuable, I've already told you the answer. It's Tesla, of course it is. Now Tesla is kind of, you know, stands out compared to the rest of the industry. It's bigger in terms of market value than the, the next nine automotive companies. So Toyota is number two there. Toyota is the biggest total in terms of market share, but market share today doesn't mean that necessarily you're the most successful company. It doesn't convert into value all the time. Now, number four on the list is an interesting one. Can anybody guess which of these cars is number four in terms of the most valuable car company in the world? Well, it's actually the bottom right-hand one. Does anybody know what that one's called? That company is NIO. Um, NIO is a Chinese um, premium, so a luxury electric vehicle company. It actually has relatively small um, in terms of volume of, of production at the moment, but incredible in terms of its market value. It is now more valuable than BMW as a company. So, you know, if you were to go to Germany and talk to the likes of BMW or Daimler-Benz, you know, they're really in shock at a world which is changing incredibly quickly in terms of this new generation of companies who are playing quite a different game. In fact, you could say that one car, one car, one company shouldn't be there if this is about automotive because it doesn't even define itself as an automotive company. Which of these companies is not an automotive company? Well, it's actually Tesla. So if you look at Tesla, Tesla de describes itself as an energy company accelerating the transformation to sustainable energy is the purpose statement of tesla and actually the most profitable business unit is batteries um, made in its gigafactories in shanghai and soon in berlin let's look at the energy sector which of these companies is most successful in 2020 well actually 2020 was the year when you know the traditional giants of energy like exxon nobel kind of plummeted in value and there was a moment in June last year 
when really people kind of started to wonder what was happening, Next Era became more valuable than ExxonMobil, which had been one of the giants of American uh, corporate world for decades and decades and decades. Even companies like BP and Shell in Europe, they've been eclipsed by a new generation of companies. Look at Ørsted, for example, the Danish company, which in just 10 years has transformed itself entirely from being a carbon state-run energy company to a zero carbon uh, renewable private company. So halfway through that period at IPO, it's a fantastic case study in true business transformation and the courage of a leader to make fundamental change happening. Last year, it was voted the world's most sustainable company. And this year, it's a French company, Schneider Electric. Now, Schneider is not just generating renewable energy, but also storing it. So a bit like Tesla, but that storage of energy becomes really important, particularly if you want to have local grids, smart cities, and being able to flatten out the net or reduce the cost of energy for everybody into the future. If we look at banking, you know, which one of these is the most successful company in the world of finance? Well, it's actually Visa and you know, the payment companies, Visa and PayPal, for example, um, you know, have, have really eclipsed the traditional banks and insurance companies. So Visa is now bigger than any bank in the world. PayPal is bigger than HSBC. PayPal is bigger than Bank of America. Can you imagine that? Some people still think of PayPal as a startup business. And then you've got kind of, you know, even non-digital, non-industrial companies like food and drink. Which one of these is the most valuable company in the food and drink sector? Well, it's actually Kuaichou Maotai, which is like a Chinese fire water. And that's, you know, $400 billion valuation, <laughs> incredible. Um, it is much more valuable than Coca-Cola. It's four times more valuable than Diageo, one of the world's leading um, alcoholic drinks company. So Kwai Chao Mao Tai has been a real incredible success story in demonstrating the shift towards new marketplaces, not just about technology and business models, but the power of new consumers in Asia. So let's think about that. You know, they are just some examples of a changing world. If we look at the mega trend, so in Business Recoded, we spent some time really looking at how is the world shifting in a really big way. So five big mega trends, and you know, I list them as A, B, C, D, E, just so that I can remember them. So A is about the aging world, a 45% increase in over 60s during the next 10 years. That's Truly phenomenal. Think about pensions, think about healthcare. How are we going to support this aging world? What are the implications for the world of work as well as healthcare? B is for booming Asia. There's a $10 trillion new middle class aching to get their hands on new consumables. Now, most of it is not just desiring the West, but it's actually creating things themselves, often quite uh, faster, be cheaper, and better than in the traditional Western markets and Western brands. So look at brands like Xiaomi, for example, in terms of mobile phones. Scenes for cognitive technology. So not just technology itself in the fourth industrial revolution, but intelligent technologies, technologies which can think. And I think the real big story about technology over next year is the combination of how humans and technologies work together. It's how, how te technology augments humans and how humans augment technology. On average, according to the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report came out two months ago, there would be more jobs created, 133 million compared to jobs lost um, over the next five years due to um, the rise of new technologies, robotics, AI, and, and other kinds of um, technological working. D is for dense living, the rise of these mega cities. And actually, while some of you may feel that during the pandemic we wanted to leave the city, on average, many, many more have come to the cities in search of healthcare, in search of education, and in search of jobs. So cities across the world are booming. 45 mega cities, more than 10 million people in the world today. 33% of them are in Asia. You know, Shenzhen, Guangdo, Guangzhou. These are the cities which we should know as well as London, New York, or Tokyo. But the biggest cities 
beyond the next 10 years will actually be in Africa. So King Sharjah, Dar es Salaam and Lagos, they are the real mega mega cities which we will see um, emerging over a slightly longer period of time. But what are the consequences for that? of where you focus your markets, about how you distribute things, about how people shop, about how people live, about how you provide education and healthcare. What are the consequences in these cities as they seek to get smarter at the same time as they get bigger? And then you've seen the, the, the huge kind of focus on E, earth renewal, the sustainability question. So how can we move from crisis to circularity? Because actually, whilst we do want to reduce our carbon emissions by two, um, two degrees, if you like, overall in terms of global warming, we need to produce more at the same time because we have more people on planet Earth. So over that next 10 years, exciting 10 years of more change, 35% more food will be required. So we have to fundamentally think new ways in which we produce our food. 50% more energy, 40% more water, by 2030, huge, massive challenges to rethink how industries work and how can we achieve things within our sustainable means. So there are some of the big, huge mega trends and what I tend to get with organizations is to say, well, how are you part of this? Which trends are most important to you? How are you riding those trends? How are you shaping those trends? And, and how do you look at them from a 10 year perspective? But behind that, it's really you know, the big shifts because it's not a linear process. Addressing that future world, that next 10 years, not really the future, coming up pretty fast, we have huge disruption. The disruption of technology, you know, changing fundamentally the way in which we compete, but also the way in which we work internally and across our value chains. The disruption, the challenge, of social and environmental issues, both of them being important. Social actually, in many cases, is more resonating with your consumers. The pandemic challenge in terms of thinking about how do we recover, but how do we learn from, and how do we build back better, and how do we reimagine our businesses for a better future, seize the opportunity of this change. And then this new competitive landscape, so the new markets of the world, the new audiences, the new generations of consumers emerging. So because of all of that, that's why I believe we need a new code for business. So what is this new code for business? You know, now is the time when we really need to think in a very different way. And the way in which I structured the book was really to think about some of the big shifts, first of all. And these shifts are not unfamiliar to you. You, you will have heard of them. But really what's important, whether you're a HR person or a marketing person or a finance person, is really how they connect together and how they join up to change our mindset as an organization in terms of what our priorities are, in terms of what we do and how we do it and how we measure success. So the shifts kind of you can see there, the shift from profit to more enlightened progress, not being a slave to the short term, certainly the profits, but thinking about how do we measure success in different ways. Profits still being important, but more purposeful too. The shift from uncertain survival, where we're always just kind of scrabbling to survive in a world of stagnant growth, particularly in the West, to futuristic growth, where we see new spaces to grow in different ways. Creating markets rather than just competing in the box which we think we work in. So redefining markets. Human ingenuity will triumph over technology. Ecosystems will triumph over individuality. So working together as much more collaborative organizations with many different partners, with individuals and huge organizations to help us go further and to go faster. Transforming, not just making small changes, but transforming the organizations like Ersted we talked about from Denmark, that huge transformation fundamentally in 10 years, but sustaining that over time and making it sustainable too. And then the challenge for managers to step up, to have that courage, to look ahead, to think about where am I going and how can I have the guts, the boldness to take my organization further, to open up its potential by opening up my own eyes and to take it to new places. So 
the shifts in the book, and I'm not going to focus on these in too much detail because you can read the book and you can have the slides and you can kind of um, you can find out more later. The first shift, I call it aurora because aurora is that morning sky, which is a new awakening. It really kind of makes you think in a different way and it's incredibly inspiring. But stepping up like the diagram at the top with the courage to extend your viewpoint, to see a bigger space, to look forward in a bigger way. So shape your future in your own vision. Don't just wait for it to happen, but be future shapers. Having more far foresight and being more far-sighted. So how do you do that? A range of techniques which people can use to start to look at not just the trend, but to look at the parallels from other places, to look at the clues of what's happening today. The future is already here, but unevenly distributed. Inspired by a purpose, which gives you a North Star to see through a world of complexity and uncertainty, but also to see your business as a platform which can do so much more. A platform where you can solve some of the biggest problems, social, environmental, a platform where your people, you can unlock their potential, the talents they have, not just make them slaves to the existing machine. And to think about how can you achieve success beyond profit. Profit matters, but creating more positive impact. Larry Fink shook up the world three years ago when he said to all the CEOs who invest in, I would only invest if you can demonstrate a real purpose, a difference you make beyond just the profit you make. Pat Brown, he left his job to create Impossible Foods when he said, I want to make a bigger difference to the world. So as a biochemist in a, in a university, I can't make as big a difference as I could if I create the best burger in the world. And it's not made from animals, but it drips of blood and it tastes fantastic, not real blood. And you know, he's now accelerated the growth massively of his own business, Impossible. Or Anne Wojcicki, she was an investment analyst. She read a report, data's the future of healthcare. She jumped into a car, she went to, 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 to Silicon Valley, she created a company by 23andMe, which um, decodes your DNA. From $9,000 when she started the business, she got it down to $99, so everybody can almost now um, genetically map out their, their own body. You can understand everything about where you come from and everything about where you can go from. Go to the future of medicine personalized started last year. The second shift is Komarebi. Komarebi is when you can look above the forest and things which look dense and kind of blurred suddenly become much clearer. What I'm trying to do is to get people to jump from the future backwards. Because if you jump out of the mess of today, you can suddenly see a much clearer view as to what you really want to do, say in five years time. So get teams of people, exec teams, to jump to the future. Or as a project team, jump to the future of what your project looks like when it's finished, and then map backwards. Start with the five years, then go to four, to three, to two, to one. I bet you this year, and then next year will look differently if you've started mapping it out from the future as opposed to just making more of what you do today. And let's say, let's make it slightly better. So explore the ABCDE of the mega trend. Use the power of networks is incredible. Let's just pick on Emily Weiss there. She runs the world's fastest growing beauty business. It used to be just a blog where she would share beauty advice and then they would share beauty tips back with her in terms of everybody who followed her. They shared pictures of their bathrooms, what was in their cabinets. It became a high content community of people with a passion for beauty. One day somebody said, let's create a brand. She said, let's create a, call, call it Glossier. Now it's a co-creating network of people all across the world who love beauty products. And Glossier has become this co-creating, co-influencing, and incredibly successful beauty company with a very different model. Let's look at tip three, the shift in terms of how can you recode your market? Don't define yourself by saying, I'm in energy, I'm in banking, I'm in automotive. They are all old fashioned descriptions of what you're in. That's the what you do. The what you do is not important as how you do it, or even more important, why you do it. You probably recognize this, there's the golden circle. So reframe what business you're in. Think about, as the Japanese call it, your ikigai from a personal point of view, and connect that with your business purpose. How can you give people, employees and consumers, 
a better reason to get up each morning, a better reason to love your business and your brand. So think about market recording, a bit like Red Bull did many years ago. Ali Parza, he created a fantastic healthcare business, telemedicine, as we talked about beforehand, based in London, or Hoiling Mitan. She was a McKinsey consultant. She got taxis in, 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 in Kuala Lumpur. She felt unsafe. She wanted to make a taxi service better. She created Grab, which is a bit like Uber, but now she has a service which will deliver anything. Um, to her consumers across most of Southeast Asia. Grab is one of a number of super apps across the world, like Geo in India, like Rappi in Colombia, like Line in Japan, who will bring together anything supported by a payment infrastructure, which will allow you better access and better understanding of the consumer than any company could have otherwise. Recode your innovation. I know I'm going fast, but this is, connections between all these ideas too. So recode your innovation from not just thinking about technology, which we tend to get obsessed with, not just thinking about products, which we certainly are obsessed with, but thinking about people. You know, how can you solve the important problems better? So using that designer mindset, using faster experiments, so connecting design thinking and lean startup together, if you like, to a point where you can really create immersive, intuitive, and experiments which you learn faster by testing new ideas, making new connections. In Leonardo da Vinci said it's all about kind of learning from other places, copy, adapt, paste. And so being able to bring all of those together to fuse humanity and technology at the same time. You know, from Rene Redzepi, the world's leading chef in Copenhagen, foraging in the forest to make up his menu every day based on what he finds. So it's it's almost kind of catalytic in terms of what will be on the menu each day of Noma. Stick fix using AI to really understand the consumer and a direct to consumer fashion business. Or Debbie Shetty, you know, Mother Teresa's heart surgeon, inspired when he was caring for her to say, you know, how can I make a bigger difference to the world? And today he provides a, a, a healthcare insurance service to almost every Indian in the world at incredible low cost. So reinventing healthcare in that part of the world. Recode your organization. So thinking differently about how organizations work. They are certainly not, we all know, those hierarchical static organizations of Henry Ford we mentioned uh, at the beginning 250 years ago, layers of bureaucracy, functions and processes. You know, probably 80% of people do not work in functional roles today. They work much more flexibly, much more adaptively in project roles. And most people you know, spend most of the time mixing in different groups across the organization all the time. So project work dominates over functional roles. So what does that mean for organizations? Well, it means that we live in a very different way. It means teams matter much more than functions and much more than any kind of structures. Teams become much more self-managing. Collaboration between those teams become extreme and intense and incredibly powerful. That's where you get the great creativity but also the collaboration amongst those teams to create learning, to create energy and rhythm um, so that the organization achieves its coherent purpose at the same time. Bringing together partners, almost like a butterfly, so you can have relatively small organizations, but large ecosystems which allow you to fight way above your weight, like Arm Semiconductor, for example. And then we look at people you know, in the book, um, interviewing people like Reed Hastings in terms of why does he have a new no rules culture, incredibly, incredibly performance driven, but also a very empowered culture within Netflix. Take as much holiday as you want to, you know, no expenses culture. You know, it's about making your own judgment. Zhang Lumin will come to you in a moment. I had an amazing uh, meeting with him. Um, at the beginning of last year. Or on Ari Weinside, you know, in, in Ann Arbor in the States, a small deli business, but incredibly powerful in terms of how he's engaged a group of people who absolutely love him and spread the word across each of his different uh, uh, restaurants and delis, which are now spreading across all of America. Synergy is about transforming the way you transform. So think about how can you create a portfolio for today and the portfolio for tomorrow? So this big dilemma we always have, dual transformation, you might call it. You know, how do we actually improve today, but also how do we create tomorrow at the same time? 
and getting used to that kind of dual thing. So how do you create it in terms of the structures, the performance metrics, the groups of people? Is it the same people doing both? Or do you have different people? How do they interact? How do you use the assets of one organization to achieve both things? And how do you cope culturally with the emotional agility, as Susan David requires it, the emotional agility to cope with all of this change and to make change a positive, relentless force in the organization, which really drives energy and progress. And the cycle time, the rhythm, almost works faster than the marketplace so that you get ahead. And the final shift is about leaders themselves. So none of this is going to happen unless leaders step up. We've heard how Mary Barra, she took the risk of spending a billion pounds on crews and created you know, a future which we now see happening in Dubai. When Jane Fraser, a few months ago, she stepped up to become the CEO of Citigroup, she said context, courage and creativity, the three C's, or what will matter most to her when she looks around the organization, context, courage, and creativity. Daniel X said, you know, I'm not a good, I'm not a good leader. I'm a great coder. That's why I created this company. And he had to learn how to find some of those things which Jane Fraser is now talking about. So everybody can be leaders, but in very different ways. One of the things to do is to have courage. Next is to think about what is the right style for you, different styles in different situations. Think about the legacy which you want to leave behind. How can, as a team, you gather people who can make smarter decisions, maybe in, in, enabled by technology? And the, the leadership DNA there, which we created based on 40,000 interviews at, at IE Business School. So leaders are about three big things, creating better futures, making change happen, and delivering positive impact. And you can see some of the characteristics behind that. So, that's the seven shifts. And behind the seven shifts, if you go into the book, just to blow your minds, but not really, is a set of codes. Now, the point of codes is that you don't have to do everything. The point of codes is that you choose what is right for your business. The point of codes is how you connect them together. And so that's really the point of the book designed in these 49 codes underneath the seven big, big shifts to think about what is the things which your organization needs to focus on and how do I actually connect those different aspects together, the outside and the inside, the human and the technical or process-based things, to how do you connect them together to create a better organization, more capable to create a better future. So I've talked about a huge number of organizations in a short period of time, and you can see some more of them here. So I'm not going to talk through them all, but you can see them yourselves. And if you go online to my website, you can look at all of the case studies here. You can deep dive into any of them. And in the workshops, we look at any of these different case studies and actually many more. But it's how do you take the stories of these innovators changing the world right now in every different sector? And how do you apply those stories, giving people inspiration, but also giving them real insight and the ability to create something better in your own organizations. You know, Satya Nadella, I work very closely with Microsoft and um, I've, I've worked with him the last three years. He's an incredibly powerful, but also passionate leader. He said, you know, it's not just about reimagining our organizations, our strategies for the future. It's about reimagining why we work. I was, in, um, I was in Seattle and he said, you know, what we should be doing is creating organizations which are platforms of talent. You know, they, they create this platform which we allow the, the, the individuals who work there to unlock what they are interested in, are passionate about, but what they could potentially do. And we create organizations, we create organizations around that passion and that talent as opposed to making people fit into it, which I thought was really inspiring. Then we have this idea of living organizations. So we talked about what is the future of the organization. You know, I certainly think it's much closer to the right-hand side than the left-hand side. So these living organizations, creative, collaborative, and incredibly agile. You need this strong sense of purpose, not some nice slogan, but actually something meaningful, relevant, which people can align to with a personal purpose too as well. And that's the real trick, human, uh, individual, and organizational alignment. You can get this collaboration working in a fundamentally new way, and you really create self-managing teams. 
Now, what does that mean? Well, a few people who I spoke to and really have worked with around the world, you know, Piyush Gupta, he's the CEO of the world's most innovative bank. You know, and he said, we want to create a bank which is like no other. We can't learn from banks. We want to learn from other kinds of organizations. And so they went around the world looking at different types of organizations in different sectors and also talking out lot to their customers. Their customers said, we want a bank which just fits into our lives. DBS said, we want to create an invisible bank, which is an invisible when you eat at a restaurant, when you ride on a train, when you go to school, whatever you're doing. So then they created hackathons around the world at each of their different, uh, mainly Asian offices, to engage in huge numbers of people. What does this strategy for the future really mean? How do we make change happen? And it was a really collaborative way of both creating their future vision, their, what does uh, invisible banking mean, but also how are they going to get there? And guess what? People were so much more engaged in it and so much more creative and active and the ways in which they started to think about what that means multiplied quickly. One of the tools which I use, I was using it recently with Vestas, which you saw as one of the leaders in renewable energy, is to really think about these teams. How do you get these new extreme teams working inside organizations? Well, you know, this is a model which really looks at two things, the, the accountability and the safety which is required. So you can have comfortable zones, which are nice and safe, and you achieve goals. You have lots of collaboration and it's good. It's a bit like a family business, but you don't really stretch the team. You can have lots of stretch and that tends to be quite controlling and you can get into a world of quite a lot of anxiety if you're not in careful. What's really interesting is this learning zone when you combine safety and stretch, the accountability. And that's what we've really seen, not just in sports teams when players go onto the pitch, but in healthcare, frontline and hospitals. Um, during the last 12 months. So it's real stretch situations, but real safety at the same time. And I think we can learn a lot from how can you actually learn, apply that to your organizations and create these much more extreme teams. Zhang Lumin, as I talked about, is a great guy who actually has transformed higher fundamentally over his 20 to 30 years in charge of the world's leading home appliances company. So he makes more refrigerators and also more washing machines than anybody. He's a, he's a fantastic visionary. He's actually a physicist. Um, and I was saying to him, you know, how do you see the world in 2025? And he said, well, I imagine by 2025, that's a long way off, <laughs> five years, um, or five years now four years now. Um, and I said, well, how are you going to make that happen? And he said, well, I'm going to give all of my refrigerators away free, all my washings away, washing machines away free. The future is data, a bit like Anne Wojcicki said at 23andMe. You know, once I have IoT in my refrigerators, I understand everything which goes out and everything which goes back in, the food which comes in and out of the house. So I can become a food retailer. But more than that, I could advise people in terms of what is the better food to eat? How can I become a nutritional advisor, helping them with their healthcare. How can I help them to make better meals, to enjoy their home life better? So adding more emotional value. And the same with washing machine, it becomes about the clothes, it becomes about fashion, it becomes more human and more personal. So he can see a great future when the basic products are free, but he can do so much more for his people. Now, how did he do that? Well, he created a Rendon Hay organization, which he sees as a world leading organization design. You're not just looking at how do you empower people, not just looking in terms of how do you have venture businesses, which you can see in the second diagram along, but how do you fundamentally give power to, 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 to individual groups of people in the organization? Today, he has many, many 10,000 micro businesses, no more than 100 people typically in each one. Each one of them have shares, they have equity, in their own business. They operate like startups, like individual businesses. They're incredibly close to their, to their customers. They're incredibly tight-knit in terms of what they do, and they're incredibly creative. At the same time, how it gives them a guidance, it gives them a North Star, it gives them resources, and it gives them a home. So how can you combine, if you like, the big and the small together in today's world? And really be inspired by, if you go to Quando, that organization which calls themselves an organization of entrepreneurs. So maybe that 
is a vision for the future of organizations. So have the courage to create a better future. Here are some of the people who I spoke to, some of their stories you'll find in the book, but it's really about stepping up. Think about how can you see the future in a better way, a different way, and how can you take your organization, your people, and your marketplace, your consumers, how can you take them there too? So have the courage in this world of incredible change to be extra ordinary. So think about the seven shifts. Think about how can you make those shifts? So after this session, you can have the, the presentation, you can have the first chapter of the book, go and buy the book if you want to, but think about how can you move to a better place and how can you encourage your people? How can you step up to create that better place and shape the future to your advantage? So be bold, be brave, and be brilliant. So thank you so much. And we've now got some time for your questions. Thank you very much, Peter. That was uh, really, really interesting. I think you touched on really a lot of interesting uh, points there. Um, uh, so yeah, we're going to open um, the floor to some questions. Um, so we're going to wait until those questions come in. Um, I actually did have a, a question. Um, and I mean, you did touch on you know many successful um, business cases uh, today. But, you know, with uh, the pandemic, uh, some business actually did struggle. Uh, they're today maybe in survival mode. How do you actually, you know, change? Uh, where, where did you start? Is it the, se the seven kind of the chips? If you're a business leader, what do you do? Well, I think, you know, as I think Warren Buffett said that in, in a time of crisis, you find out who are the companies who've been swimming naked. So a bit like the, when the tide goes out, you find out who are the people who had the swimming costumes on, who are the people who were swimming naked. You'll find out the companies who were kind of living on past time. So, you know, crisis is a time of incredible shakeup. It's disruption. And not every organization is going to survive. So where do you start in terms of change? Well, I guess in terms of change is you could say what's wrong with us, but you could say what's our opportunity. And um, so I would actually start with where is the opportunity? where is the future so don't keep trying to fix all the things which are wrong because really what you're doing is you're fixing an old model and probably most well the, the biggest problem which many many organizations probably most organizations have is that they live off the past they find the model which works ge found a model which worked three thirty years ago it's been kind of trying to stretch this model for the last 30 years to keep going and most organizations are afraid to let go of the models of success which got them there. So don't keep trying to fix your old organization because it's probably out of date. Yeah. Instead, look forward and think about what is the future? How is the, how is, how, where are the opportunities, particularly in the markets, because that's where change is happening. And then think about how can I create the organization of the future? And then how can I get there? You know, start, jump to the five years and then, then, then how can I get there instead of trying to kind of keep a float of a sinking ship? No, I think it's it's a very interesting point. So, so in a way, you touch on you know having a new vision. Um, but what if you know your business is not following that vision because you know you've pushed your business in survival mode? Do you actually you know let go of that business and you start a new business? Uh, what, what would you recommend? Well, some people would absolutely. So you know, it's about saying how can you actually. Um, how can you be clear in terms of what is this opportunity? What is this new direction you want to go in? Um, what is what is good about your existing business, which you want to take with you? Um, but also, how can you actually create a new business at the same time? And, and one of the things I was talking about in dual transformation is how do you keep the existing business going or even getting a bit better? But also, how can you create a new business at the same time? So, you know, we've seen lots of that. We can see it in the banks, for example, where a bank is trying to set, create a new startup, maybe a, a, a digital bank, at the same time as having a, a physical bank. We saw it in airlines, where airlines, big carriers were creating low cost carriers. But doing the two things at the same time is like having an experiment. But gradually you transition and then you say, well, does this new model work? Do I keep them separate? Um, or do I combine them together and I let go of the past? If you look at a company like IBM, for example, 
it realized that it started a consulting business, it was still making computers, then it realized the consulting business was the future, the com computer business was the past, it closed its own business. So creating this dual transformation is the really the way to do and then making decision as to whether you pivot, whether you go in parallel or whether you converge. No, thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, you can see a lot of business today actually kind of creating uh, those kind of satellite businesses. Um, actually, we have a question here. Um, are there any effective approach that you've seen that allows companies to really think differently? Wow. <laughs> okay, Julie, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, if I take you to um, DBS, um, so, so the, the bank which I talked about, the innovative bank based in Singapore, you know, one of the first things they did um, was to say, um, let's not learn from our competitors. So first of all, you know, our competitors are almost the same as us. So what they did first of all was to go and talk to their customers and their customers kind of gave them all sorts of insights and what they particularly paid attention to was language. Um, so, you know, what is the language customers did rather than just trying to kind of recode it back into their own financial language. Um, then they said, well, who are, the, who are the, the companies, who are the brands our customers love? And so the customers, maybe they loved entertainment companies or transport companies or whatever it might be. And so they, so they used the, the ideas of their customers to go and talk to those companies. So what can I learn from Disney? What can I learn from Netflix? What can I learn from, you know, I don't know, an airline? What can I learn from somebody else in terms of how I can do banking in a different way? So learning from parallel sectors becomes interesting. They also use the, 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 the mindset shift. So, you know, if you were Elon Musk, what would you do with a bank <laughs> is a great simple one. But being able to kind of put yourself in the mind of somebody who thinks in a different way, and you can use lots and lots of different people, and perhaps that's part of the power. And being able to connect ideas, so to be able to um, really fuse ideas is one of the powerful things. One of the really interesting things, we, we, we often do brainstorms, and we brainstorm ideas, but we don't actually spend much time working out what the, what the question is. So actually have a question storm before you have a brainstorm. Um, so a question storm is actually working out what is the question we're trying to answer? And you'll actually probably change it or find a better question. And that becomes a really powerful process before you start being creative in terms of solve the right question rather than what maybe have been the wrong question. So there's loads and loads of techniques. I thought DBS was amazing, um, but every one of those companies which I've talked about are doing phenomenal things. So um, there's great stories in the book about how they're all kind of really thinking differently in different ways. Thank you very much, Peter, for this. Uh, I'm conscious of time. Um, we're, we're almost uh, running out of time. So I, I would like to thank you, Peter, for um, joining the session today. Uh, for the attendees, if they want to learn more, please go ahead and um, read the book. Uh, I'm sure you'll learn lots about it. Uh, so again, thank you very much for joining the session. Um, if you want to request a slide, uh, we'll be sending out an email after the session. Just reply uh, to that email requesting the slide and uh, we'll make sure to forward the slide to you. Um, Peter, thank you very much for joining. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you and I hope we'll be able to have you again on a Headspring webinar. And I wish everyone today a wonderful day and please be safe um, and see you all for our next Headspring webinar. Bye, Peter. Very much. Be bold, brave, and brilliant, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.